We have a lot of questions come in about how do I get my spouse to talk to me? But sometimes we get it more like this. How can I talk to my spouse, particularly when it's something that's pretty touchy? Like, I think maybe my wife's having an affair. or I think maybe my husband has some kind of an addiction or I don't love my spouse anymore. And I feel like I ought to tell him or her that. We get those kind of questions as well, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode of Relationship Radio. This is Relationship Radio, an extension of Marriage Helper International, hosted by renowned marriage and relationship expert, Dr. Joe Beam, and CEO of Marriage Helper, Kimberly Beam Holmes. We answer your questions directly with research-based principles that you can implement immediately. Regardless of the situation, what we teach will not only make your relationships better, but will also help you to become the best version of yourself along the way. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to turn on notifications. Turn up the volume and prepare to take notes as we begin this week's episode of Relationship Radio. So, Kimberly, you know we get these kinds of questions all the time. Oh, by the way, let me make sure you guys know who we are. I'm Dr. Joe Beam with MH International, and this is my lovely daughter, Kimberly, who is also my boss. She is the CEO. She runs the organization for which I work. We have a whole lot of people in our organization, and we work internationally, and Kimberly is the one who heads all that up so that we can work with literally thousands of couples every year. So quite a good leader. She is without a doubt. And also finishing up her PhD in psychology. Is that correct? Psychology? Yep. Psychology. Oh, that's wonderful. So she'll be our resident psychologist and I'll be our resident uh, sex expert because that's what my degree is in. So we'll have fun helping people in all kinds of ways. Now, right now, it's not such a fun topic though. Because of the fact that people do have these things like, how do I tell my spouse that I don't want to be with him or her anymore, that I don't love him or her, or that I'm pretty sure that he or she's having an affair or whatever it might be. Now, if that's going to happen, we're going to give you three things to think about before you start that conversation. And the first has to do with environment. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean? What you want to do is to have an environment that is calm and at peace. And you think of it in two E's, environment and emotions. In other words, you don't want to bring this up when you're fighting about something else or when you're both tense about something else or both worried about something else, because those emotions, if they're already activated, if somebody's already in an emotional state to begin with, and now you want to tell them something you think they're going to react negatively to or that you might want to be fighting about, it's not it's like you're not starting down here anymore. You're actually starting from up here and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Therefore, try to find a situation where that you can be at peace. And when we say environment, obviously not with people all around you, other distractions occurring, not with the children right there and not even in a restaurant. If you can help it, where the people might overhear an environment where you can both feel safe and comfortable and an emotional level where you begin so that when you start talking about things that are going to evoke emotions, you're starting from a much lower base, which gives you a much greater likelihood of being able to discuss this in a reasonable adult type manner, rather than it becomes some kind of a screaming hissy fit. So that's one of the three things we ask you to consider before you start. The other thing that I would add to that as well is actually a a concept that I learned when I was doing my marriage and family therapy training when I was in the master's program for that. And it was this concept that as, as a therapist, you need to be the non-anxious presence in the room. Because if you are anxious, that is going to be put on your clients that come in. We're not teaching our listeners to be therapists, goodness no. But that concept is something I have held because it applies in every situation. If I am carrying the weight of anger or anxiety or fear with me into a conversation, that is going to affect the other person. They're going to see it because it, my body language will show it. It's going to change my pitch of my voice to some extent. Like there's just all of these cues that happen, many of us that we don't even realize, but subconsciously other people can realize it in us. And so the key to that in this is when you're going to talk about these tough things, you're not going to be able to be completely at peace. Like everything's hunky dory. There's, there's emotion that's behind it, but to the best that you can, 
Try and be that non-anxious presence. Try and be strong and confident and know what you're going to say. Have a plan of what you're going to say. Maybe even just a couple of things noted out so that you don't get off track or you don't end up attacking and try and stick to the point that you're trying to make or stick to the thing that you're wanting to bring up. So that's another point to this. Know what you want to say in the conversation and what you're expecting to get out of it. And the second thing to remember is don't attack. I mean, if you just want to hurt the other person, then go ahead and attack all you want to. But your relationship is going to go downhill and possibly even end. So rather than attacking when there's something you need to talk about, do your best not to attack, but to really try to make it about understanding, Mm -hmm. not yet solving the problem. That's going to come a little later. But right now, you're just trying to understand. So, Kimberly, we have a couple of questions about this that will help us explain this further. Uh, Let's go to our first question here from my husband, and one of our team members will read this, and then let's talk about that. Hey, you guys. My name is Ryan, and I work on the Facebook admin team here at Maryland Chelper. In my role, I help manage the Facebook groups and direct our members to resources based upon marriage helper research. Dr. Bean and Kimberly Holmes have asked me to read a question that was submitted by one of our listeners for today's episode. So one of our listeners asked this, how do I get my wife to talk to me? Without my knowledge, my wife spent a night alone with her brother-in-law. She said there was no sex. Beyond that, she won't talk to me about it. I told her it was a betrayal of trust and we need to talk about it, and she won't. First of all, it's just heartbreaking to hear that this situation occurred. And from your question, we certainly get the impression that you firmly believe that something that should not have happened happened that night. Even if they just talked, you feel it was a violation of your covenant with her. Like she had no right to be with him all night long, you not knowing where she was. And even though she claims she talks, you feel that that was a kind of unfaithfulness. And I understand that. And in all likelihood, there's a part of your brain that's thinking, They did more than talk because that's how most people will be thinking about this. Now, I know you want to talk about it. And I would say that talking about this is going to be crucial if you're going to actually move your relationship in a positive direction, because right now it's definitely not in a positive direction. But and this is going to be hard to do because you're hurt. It makes it appear from the way you asked the question when you said, I told her it's a betrayal of my trust and that she needs to talk about it to me. Do I think that's a fair statement on your part? Sure. Do I think it's the wisest way to start that conversation? No. Because when you do that, it's an attack. You betrayed my trust. We need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And when the other person feels attacked, they're much more likely to become defensive, which obviously she has done, where she shuts herself off behind that wall where she's not telling you anything about it. Because you've already used words like, you betrayed me. You can imagine what she's thinking in her head about what else is he going to say? What else is he going to feel? What else is he going to think if we talk about that night? Because even if I were to try to lie to him, and I'm not saying she would, but if if, if she's thinking, even if I were to try to lie to him, I'll get tripped up in that somehow because he's angry and he's going to ask other questions and I'm going to wind up telling him more than I want to. And oh my goodness, it's better if we just pretend it didn't happen than to talk about it because I already feel attacked. Now, did you hear me? (laughs) I don't blame you for what you said. I'm not saying it's a bad thing that you said it. I'm saying it's not the way to solve the problem. So instead, and this is going to be really hard to do in your situation, but it appears you really love this woman and want to make it work. Then try to understand not so much about the facts of what happened. Try to understand the emotions. Kimberly, can you help us explain better what that means? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There is a difference between the facts and the feelings of a situation. The facts, and we're not saying this happened, but just using this as an example of that night, the facts could be that she was with the brother-in-law and maybe they were in the same bedroom. Let's just say these are the facts. You could you, you as the husband could deter, you could choose to determine a lot of things from those facts. You could write a whole story about what happened in that bedroom from the facts, but the feelings that your wife has behind what happened could portray a completely different story. What if, and again, I am not saying this happened, but what if her feelings were, she was terrified. She didn't want to be in there and it was against her will. And she doesn't want to talk about it now because she feels ashamed. 
that is very common for people who experience any kind of sexual abuse. Again, I'm not saying that this is what happened. We do not know the situation. I'm simply trying to paint a different picture of what could have gone on. The feelings are more important than the facts are. And, you know, this, this reminds me of, of one of our couple's stories, Jordan and Priscilla on our team, when Priscilla ended up becoming pregnant with her affair partner's child. And she called Jordan, her ex-husband at the time, to tell him the facts. And Jordan said, because he didn't know if they had been trying to have a baby or, or what, he said, well, congratulations. And Priscilla said back to him, do you want to just hear the facts or do you want to hear my heart? Wow. And Jordan said, I want to hear your heart. And they talked for another three hours and ultimately ended up reconciling, remarrying, and Jordan adopted that baby as his own child. And so that's the power of the difference in facts versus feelings. Mm -hmm. Whatever the facts are, and at this point, we don't know what they are, but whatever the facts are, it's really more important for her to be able to tell you what she felt during and what she felt afterwards, mm -hmm. because that reveals more about a person than anything is what they feel after some event has occurred. Okay. So you were there for an hour or they were all night, I guess he said there with him all night long. If you're saying, why did you do that? What were you trying to do? Did oh, you, et cetera. She's going to become more and more defensive. If you were to look at her and say, uh, I just want to understand the emotions tied to that. I just put, what were you feeling at the time? What did you feel afterwards? Now, if you're going to do that, then we say what you want to do is you want to speak with emotional transparency on your part and start the conversation this way. Look, I know you don't want to talk about it and I can understand why. As a matter of fact, I was talking to these uh, people who work with marriages the other day and they said, it sounds as if I were attacking you and they understand why you bottled up yourself. So let me just tell you this. Let me tell you why it's important for me to know. And it's not so much as to what occurred. I just want to understand the emotions behind that because I still love you. And I don't know how we're going to have a future if, if I've got this uncertainty in my mind, if I feel like that you're deceiving me. If I feel that, then it's going to be very difficult for me to trust you and give you my whole heart, which is what I want to do. In other words, explain with your own emotional transparency why it's important for you to talk about it. Now, if you can say it honestly, don't lie to her, but if you can say it honestly, I'm not going to attack you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to make any negative, terrible, bad thing happen. As a matter of fact, all I want to do is for us to get past it. Now, don't say that unless you're going to live up to that. Don't make that promise. And, and then when she does get open and transparent and then you just blast her or use it against her in some fashion, then that'll say a lot of bad things about your own character. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to understand the emotions. The problem can be solved later. So Kimberly, do you think that's the best path forward? Uh, by the way, how tough is that going to be for him to do? We don't know him, but in general, how tough would that be for a person to do? Extremely hard for any human being, any human being, because it's hard to stop seeing things from our own perspective, from the stories that we've told ourselves and, mm -hmm. and really enter into a conversation with a clean slate just to hear the other person without attacking, without being defensive ourselves. It's hard, but you know what? You can do it. And even if it doesn't go perfectly, you can do better the next time. You can do better the next time. Now, if you feel you want some help with that, mm -hmm. then please contact us. Uh, what's the better way, Kimberly, for them to call our toll-free number or them to go to our website and schedule an appointment with one of our client representatives who can listen to their story and try to understand and guide them to what? whatever we can do to help them, which would be the better path for them. Yeah. The best path is the one that you would take now. So if you are a person who is willing to pick up your phone and say, yes, I'll call the front office. They'll get me set up with one of the client relations reps and I'll be able to talk to them. Then go ahead and do that. The number is 866-903-0990. The other option is to go to our website and you can either chat on our website and get connected with someone that you can speak to that will give you a call, or you can fill out one of the forms. You can go to our workshops page, fill out a form there to request to speak with someone and you'll get a call back from someone within 24 hours. So whichever one you will do is the best one for you to do.
Yeah. And understand that uh, the person that will call you back is not a counselor or a therapist. It's, it's a person who will just try to listen, understand, and then guide you toward whatever it is that we can do for you. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are not as young and fast as Kimberly, that number again, a little slower. <laughs> <laughs> eight six six nine zero three zero nine nine zero. I'll say it one more time. Eight six six nine zero three zero nine nine zero. Because Kimberly, if I were listening and I heard you fly through that number like that, I'd be going, whoa, whoa, wait, back up. <laughs> <laughs> and the website is relatively easy to remember. Marriage Helper. That's Marriage Help E R, marriagehelper.com. So, Kimberly, we have another question as well. Let's go ahead and get to that. One of our team members will read it for us. Hey, you guys. My name is Hannah, and I work on the marketing team here at Marriage Helper. In my role, I typically help provide resources to our clients through our various social media platforms. Dr. Beam and Kimberly Holmes have asked me to read a question that was submitted by one of our listeners for today's episode. I don't know how to tell my husband that I feel completely disconnected from him physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. It makes me feel like I don't love him anymore. What I hear from this question is that you don't want to hurt your husband. You're not feeling these things toward him, but you don't want to tell him that you don't have these emotions toward him, these feelings toward him. That actually says something good about you. It means you care about how he feels, that you care about his future. And, and so I give you kudos for that. Thank you. Thank you for caring about his own emotions. At the same time, though, if you have drifted apart emotionally and you don't feel these connections to him, you must realize that that gives you some degree of vulnerability. I mean, you may be the most moral person on planet Earth, and if you are, wonderful. But even the strongest of the strong, when they feel emotionally empty, I'm with a partner with whom I have no connection, these people are vulnerable. Meaning if someone comes along that does things, says things, where and, and you have time enough with each other that you start developing these kind of emotions for him, then I don't care how strong you are, there's a possibility that you'll wind up doing something that's in strong violation to your belief and value system. And so while I appreciate you don't want to hurt him, I'm saying that this is something you really need, need to, to deal with. Now, since you know, or at least you anticipate, that he's going to feel badly if you tell him these things, then we say, well, be sensitive to that. That's good. You're not going to do it in anger. You're not going to be mean and yell and scream. <sighs> But while being sensitive, it's still a conversation you're going to need to have. And we said earlier, make sure you get the right environment, the right emotions, those kinds of things that counts here. And then explain how you feel. But Kimberly, we often say in a situation like this, don't just explain how you feel, but give a potential path forward. Mm -hmm. What do we mean when we tell people that? Yes, we mean that it doesn't do a whole lot of good a lot of times to simply say, I'm no longer attracted to you, or I feel disconnected from you in all these ways, and then just kind of leave it there. Because yeah. it just leaves the other person to think, what am I supposed to do? I didn't even know this was an issue. You're bringing this on me. Is there any hope? Things can get out of control at that point. Mm -hmm. And so it's really great, especially when you're when you're thinking about this before doing it, to also present with, and so here are some things I would like us to do. Here's some ways that I would like us to try to connect to each other again, emotionally, physically, intellectually, spiritually. And, and take some time now to think about what those are. Is it that there's a lack of sex in your marriage? Is that what you mean by some of these? And that you would like to start having sex more often? Use that in, in the conversation. I would like to connect more by having sex more often or going on a date once, once a month or whatever it is that you are seeking for. Provide some kind of option, some path of a way out. But it's also great to be able to include your husband in what that could be. You could say, here's some things I've thought of, but what about you? How have you been feeling? And is there anything you would like us to do to connect more emotionally, physically, intellectually, and spiritually? Mm -hmm. And you can even get more detailed in, in what Kimberly's saying, like not just that I want more sex, but I want it to be more lovemaking. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. But you're actually right, Kimberly, you need to involve the other person. But you give hope 
to the other person rather than pure panic or fear. Mm -hmm. When you have thought through some potential steps forward and, and you, as Kimberly just said, you have to do that before you have the conversation, go ahead and make your notes, know exactly what you're going to talk about when you do. And then you guys can negotiate what you do, Mm -hmm. but he has a right to know that that bond is fading or has faded. You have a right to let him know that so that you guys can try to find some way to put it back together. I know you don't want to hurt him, but I think you're going to wind up hurting him a whole lot more if you don't deal with this now. Now, when you first tell him, even if you're offering alternatives, like we can try this, we can might, here's a path forward that I suggest, he may react in a very negative way to begin with. But understand that sometimes people get shocked. Now, if, if he has not noticed it and to him is coming out of left field somehow, then, then, then his reaction may be anger. It may be hurt. It may be to attack you. Don't react to his initial reaction because of the fact that when humans are hit with something they didn't anticipate or expect, sometimes they do stupid things. Sometimes they say stupid things. He may react wonderfully. Yes, let's figure out how to fix this. He may react with pain. He may sulk and pout for two or three or four or five days. Don't let all that throw you. At least now you have the conversation started. And when the time presents itself, you're going to be very open and transparent with him. And you have to have him being very open and transparent with you. Now, don't try to force that. You can't make that happen. But the way you're going to encourage that to happen is when he does tell you what he feels, you're going to try to understand. If he says, I'm blindsided, I understand. And I know that's got to be scary. I, I don't know what to say. I understand that you're a good man. And, and I know that this is making you think. If he, Whatever he says, you affirm. Kimberly, what else do we need to say about that to make that clearer? Mm-hmm. Well, that that's it. I think you've done a great job, but that's a reminder of this isn't a time for you to get defensive at anything he might say back because the goal of the conversation is what can we do to reconnect? You entered, you started the question with, I'm dis- I feel disconnected in these ways. So when you're having the conversation, reconnection is the goal. And so be sure that you are modeling that and even your responses to him. That will help with the reconnection. So just be mindful, be mindful of your responses, be mindful of the goal that you have for the conversation and keep that at the forefront of your, of your mind. And be prepared for him to be defensive. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? I do this for you. I do that for you. We did that together, etc. <laughs> and when he does that, don't argue with him. Just say, I understand that you do that and I appreciate that. But somehow we have still lost the connection, at least on my side. Mm-hmm. So don't argue, don't fight. Mm -hmm. So Kimberly, how would we wrap up what we've talked about today? What are the key takeaways here? When dealing with tough conversations, when thinking about how to talk about tough things, here are the three key takeaways we have from what we've talked about. The first is remember that the environment you are in and the environment that you create with the presence that you bring into the room and your emotions are very important. So do your best to make it a peaceful environment, a peaceful emotion that you bring into it, Bring trying to be as peaceful as you can with your presence in the room. All of that will help the conversation to go the best that it can. The second is that listening gets you much further than explaining or attacking. It is in both of the the questions that we had submitted in, there is something that needs to be brought up. But after bringing it up and again, using those I statements, listen, whatever defensiveness might come back, seek to listen, ask more questions. And if it gets to the point where it's just not being a productive conversation, it's fine to, to shut it down for that day and come back to it at a later time. You don't have to fix everything in this one conversation. Be sure you're in a stance to be able to listen. And then third is to be sure to be transparent with your spouse if you expect them to be transparent with you. And then a bonus key takeaway is thank your spouse for when they open up to you, for listening to what you have to say, for trying to work through the tough things with you. When that happens, show your appreciation through word and action. It reinforces those positive behaviors that you're wanting to see over and over again. 
Now, if you've listened to this and you're thinking, I heard you, but I don't know that I can do this. I, I want more information. I want to talk to somebody that can help me think this thing through. Again, you can contact us at Marriage Helper. That's Marriage Help ER, MarriageHelper.com. And if you schedule time with uh, one of our client representatives, understand that one thing that's available to you, we have many, but we have coaches. And you can book 45 minute sessions with the coaches and, and get them to help you think through exactly how you want to do this, if you will, if that's what appeals to you. If you don't need that or don't want that, we're not trying to push it on you. We're not trying to sell you something you don't need. Mm-hmm. We're just saying we have people that work in our organization that uh, will stand alongside you and help you think this through and be there for you if, uh, if it doesn't go like you anticipate. And then you can call back to that coach if you, for example, decided to use that option and say, well, I did it, but here's what he said. And the coach can help you calm down, think it through, plan your next step, those kinds of things. They they are not counselors or therapists. They're coaches. They help to coach you through what you need to do. If you want to get started with coaching, you can actually do it starting right now. You can go to marriagehelper.com slash coaching. Again, that's marriagehelper.com slash coaching. And there you will be able to see all of our coaches. You'll be able to see the schedules, availability, and book the time that works best for you. You can either get one session or you can get a three package of coaching. You can go ahead and get started on getting that and getting it scheduled right now. Now, we talk about a lot of things on Relationship Radio, trying to answer the questions that you guys have sent in. And we had questions about okay, my children are hurting because my husband or my wife is leaving the marriage and not helping the kids deal with this at all. What do I do? We'll talk about that in the next episode of Relationship Radio. Now, hang on. We've got a couple more things to share with you. But Kimberly, I will see you in the next episode. Okay, if you guys are listening to this video, that means that you're probably struggling with your marriage in some regard right now, as was I before attending the three-day workshop. I think the most difficult part about it is that in the struggle, it tends to be one-sided and you're not sure what to do because either your spouse doesn't want to continue the marriage or they don't want to participate in the workshop. But after coming to this three-day workshop, I feel like we've learned so much that it can help in two ways. One, if we don't decide to work it out, we're still both going to be better people, better communicators with each other, with our kids, with anybody else in our lives because we attended this. And additionally, if we do decide to work it out, we now have the steps so that we can follow the path and really understand exactly what we need to do to try to get that communication going again and move things in the right direction and not just move back to where we were, but rebuild stronger than we ever were before. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Relationship Radio. Please refer to the notes in the description to learn more about any resources mentioned in this episode. Please visit our website at marriagehelper.com for more information about our online courses marriage workshops, and coaching. If you would like immediate help for your marriage situation, then click on the link on the screen to schedule a free marriage strategy call with one of our team members. We exist to help save marriages and strengthen families. We look forward to interacting with you on the next episode of Relationship Radio.